crocodile mummy is one of the most amazing things in our collection. It is the largest mummy that the British Museum owns, and it, well, we haven't seen it on display for over 75 years. It uh, arrived in the museum in 1895. Uh, it was excavated at a site called uh, Komombo, which is located about 50 kilometers north of Aswan in Upper Egypt. And it was excavated by uh, Jacques de Morgan, who was the Director General of the Egyptian Antiquities Service at the time. My name is Barbara Wills, and I work in the Department of uh, Conservation, uh, Conservation and Scientific Research at the British Museum. And I've worked here for many years now, and over those years I've had an opportunity to specialise. And one of the things, one of the areas that I specialise in have been uh, the care of mummies, animal and human. When the idea for the crocodile exhibition came up, I felt it was a wonderful idea. And I was really delighted that the crocodile came my way because it's a rare and wonderful experience to get an opportunity to work on a 12 foot, four meter crocodile. It's a fabulous piece. It's absolutely one of the most amazing amazing artifacts. It is over almost four meters long and it consists of a large adult crocodile and on its back there are a series of uh, small mummified hatchling crocodiles and they've been just set on the back basically imitating what you see in nature. As part of preparation for the Room 3 show, we decided we'd do a CT scan of the crocodile. We were really lucky. Uh, we found a CT scanner in the Diagnostic Imaging Unit of the Royal Veterinary College here in London and they were generous enough to um, allow us to come and scan this crocodile and it was a fantastic experience. The thing with CT scanning is that uh, it allows us to investigate in a non-invasive way. It really told us an awful lot about the mummification and the procedures with the animal itself. The lower part of the torso uh, is still intact, but the upper part of the torso they've filled with linen packing. But in the CT scans now we can see the stones in its stomach, the gastroliths that were used to help it digest its, its meals and uh, maybe for ballast as well. Uh, we could see the remains of its last meal and there were also three very small um, unidentified metal objects and we still don't know what they are. Um, I don't know if we'll ever find out. I saw the crocodile, I assessed him or her. When I say assess, this means I look at it from the point of view of how stable is it? How resilient is it? What must I do so that it can travel safely to and from CT scanning, it can travel safely to go on display, it can be on display and then go back into storage and beyond, because if I'm going to work on it as a conservator, I would also want to ensure that it's stable for the next decade, two decades, five decades, ten decades. I'm looking as far ahead as it's possible for me uh, to look ahead, and so there's a degree of ongoing care with a crocodile. I note those areas that are unstable, that are cracked, that are possibly going to drop off, dislocate, delaminate, become friable, shatter. All those areas, that's what I'm looking for. And um, I intervene to secure them uh, prior to the CT scan. There are some very straightforward techniques and there are some more complex techniques. But essentially I did the more straightforward techniques with this, which was to encapsulate it and bind it in such a way that uh, when it travelled, nothing would fall off. And there were one or two areas where I could see a crack and something was about to come off. And I was able to insert a paste of stable Japanese tissue paper along with a really stable adhesive we use, Clucel G hydroxypropyl cellulose. You can use this to insert into cracks, to uh, put underneath areas that are delaminating that are coming apart and then you carefully weight it in place, it dries, it's going to stay. So that careful packing, along with the museum assistants, enabled the crocodile to travel safely for the scanning. In our records, somebody, well, we don't know who, suggested that there might actually be a series of crocodiles, as in a large crocodile, um, a slightly smaller crocodile on its back, and then the series of, of hatchlings. 
but we were able to discover with the CT scanning that clearly there was only one large adult crocodile and um, the hatchlings on its back. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise because we had to come back and say, oh, it looks like we've lost an object. Uh, but in fact, it, it really told us an awful lot about the mummification and the procedures with the animal itself. Before any object goes on display, um, a conservator needs to check it out to make sure that it stays, um, it's consolidated, it's safe to be displayed, and there isn't going to be any damage um, incurred to the object um, during the course of its exhibition. The next phase is me setting aside a period of time devoted almost exclusively to the care of the crocodile. And essentially, I started from the snout and I worked my way down to the tail. And this involved Firstly, removing of the dust, because over the period of a century or more, dust accumulates. And not only is dust visually unnecessary and unpleasant, and it obscures the detail, it's also potentially damaging. Quite often the dust is carbon rich, and under high humid conditions, that might actually begin to damage some of the surface. So there's a lot to be said for getting rid of dust, other than the aesthetic. We've got a whole menu of different dust removal techniques, but mine was a museum vacuum cleaner. I could adapt the museum vacuum cleaner to take a plastic pipette that I had modified the end of. So you got a very, very fine point of suction, and that was great because I could get into the nooks and crannies, and I could also pick out gently anything that was lost in the nooks and crannies but might have belonged to the surface of the crocodile. So some things I was able to pick out and think, I know where that goes, and I could stick it back. This removes a certain amount of dust, but because the crocodile has such a wonderful, chocolatey, toffee-like, shiny surface, and I wanted that to be apparent to the visitors, I was able to lift off the dust using another dry cleaning technique. So essentially, it's a piece of soft rubber called Groomstick and I roll it over the surface and it picks up the dust and it's a satisfying job to do. And often as I clean I will leave a marker to say this is the bit I want to come back to, here I must secure this. And this is a more subtle technique whereby you get the adhesive flows in and underneath the bitumen surface of the crocodile. And this is quite it's reasonably sophisticated. You have to flood the area first with white spirits. Then you take your medium for consolidation and with a fine pointed brush, allow it to drop into your crack. And because you flooded it with white spirits, the adhesive flows in, follows the trajectory of the uh, crack. So the white spirits allows it to penetrate those vulnerable areas and it, the other job it does is that it stops the adhesive evaporating back up to, the, up to the surface. So it also forms a kind of a barrier layer, so it dries gently and it dries in those areas and sticks together those pieces that you want stuck together. So very pleasing technique. We also use science to help inform our conservation processes. So we used SEM scanning uh, to um, figure out what sort of um, botanical uh, material and linens were associated with the um, mummification processes. So today we're going to use this piece of equipment which is a secondary electron microscope or we shorten it to SEM to look at the samples that we took from the crocodile mummy. So we have four different samples to look at so we took samples from the external textile covering the mummy as well as the textile that's also inside the crocodile's mouth and then we also have samples of the reeds and the um, string that was attaching the baby crocodiles to the back of the mummy. So what we're doing is we're using this microscope to um, take images which will help us identify what the fibres in all the textile materials are. So it works sort of similar in a way to how um, a camera would work except instead of using light like a camera would we're using a beam of electrons um, and where the image is the interaction of the electrons with the sample. So the first thing we have to do is we need to mount the sample. All we have to do is gently stick the sample down onto the surface. 
and just lightly press it down to make sure it's stuck, but we don't want to squish it too much because we'll destroy some of the structure of the fibers. So the next step is to attach the sample to the base plate which goes into the machine and it sets the working distance that we'll use when we're looking at the sample. And then we just measure the height to make sure we know what distance our sample is so we won't get too close to the electron beam when we put it inside the chamber. And it slides in and then locks in place. And then we close up the chamber again. So we've taken all the air out of the chamber, so now we can turn on the electron beam. So here's the first glimpse of the sample. So what we would generally do now is we would just search on the sample, looking for areas that will help us find the identifying features um, for this particular sample. And actually what's nice is already here we can see these dislocations. They sort of look a little bit like a knee joint and that is indicative of flux. And then all this other stuff that you can see on the sample is from the resin material that's covering the, the mummy crocodile, so that's all on this sample too. The fibres are splitting a lot, um, which indicates that it's quite a brittle material, which you would expect from it being aged and old. So we would just then look around the rest of the sample, looking for other features. There are more identifying features for flax, but obviously that, sort of, that can take a while. It's, you zoom in and out a lot as you move around. So of course, one of the important questions to ask is, what is the resin? And uh, the curator I was able to get Caroline Cartwright, the scientist, to come and do analysis on the resin. The crocodile is covered with a very thick um, resin. Uh, we analyzed the resin and it's, it's made from conifer and beeswax and we had thought it was from bitumen. So this came as a bit of a surprise but it was able to inform our conservation processes. This is uh, in essence a baby crocodile uh, not long after it hatched out of the egg. What it appears to be is that after the mummification these hatchling crocodiles were mummified and prepared, placed within their sticks, bound on they themselves were covered with the resin. Certainly there was a point at which uh, blobs of resin were applied and the mummified hatchling was adhered. This was another um, journey of discovery, was to work one's way gently down the back of the crocodile and as you do you find the mummified infant crocodiles, some very evident and some not so evident. What you can see is actually the place where they were because you can see it's broken off or there's a fragment of infant crocodile or there's a little bit of reed. And so I was able to count the baby crocodiles from one end to another and I came to a number around about 30. I think there were about 30 had been on the back. Although now you can see maybe seven or eight clearly. You've got to come and see this exhibition because it's really cool. The full-length crocodile is juxtaposed against this scan, um, so you can actually see the object. Uh, you can then see the scan and find out what's inside it at the same time. And you can learn a little bit about uh, the history of the sacred animals. Basically, we're exploring how the ancient Egyptians uh, treated um, their sacred animals, both in life and in death. Uh, with uh, an examination of the mummification processes, but also uh, discovering what its last meal was and seeing how through um, textual information and representations, what they looked at, um, what they thought of the crocodile and how they revered uh, this very frightening, dangerous animal um, who they thought of as a god.